Our presentation today focuses on the marine environment and the impact of fresh water as it enters that environment. We'll be looking at the implications for water management, for coral health, and Lake Okeechobee operations. You will hear from a coral manager, a coral biologist, and a modeling expert. First up is Jamie Monty. Hello, Martin County Commissioners. I'm Jamie Monty, Southeast Regional Administrator of DEP's Office of Resilience and Coastal Protection, and I'm very excited to share with you today the results of our offshore water quality monitoring program. Slide two shows that samples were collected at three types of sites in the Southeast Florida Coral Reef Ecosystem Conservation Area, shown in turquoise on the right-hand side. Those three types of sites are inlets, ocean outfalls, and coral reefs. Samples have been collected monthly since 2016 at 115 sites. Water quality samples are analyzed in the lab for 11 analytes, including seven different types of nutrients, two sediments, silica, and salinity. And an analysis of the data from 2016 through 2018 indicates three main take-home messages. The first is on slide three, and that is that we can see the difference between the inlet contributing areas. Not only can we see signals from the land out on the reef, but we can see differences within each of the nine inlet contributing areas as well. The table uh, in front of you lists the inlets from north to south, and the results show that silica um, is highest in the north, and this comes basically off of the earth when you work the land. And ammonia um, is highest in the south, and that's tied to population changes. Um, and so this is a good thing because these are attributable to urban versus agricultural land use, and that's something that we can manage. We can see where the analytes are elevated to levels that are potentially harmful to corals. It's important to note that there currently are not regulatory thresholds for many analytes, and those that do have um, thresholds are likely construction project related and not background or chronic um, regulatory thresholds. So we compared our data to the thresholds that are published in the literature by Dr. Brian LaPointe, um, and he deemed them harmful to corals. So again, they're biological, not regulatory. Uh, so on the left-hand side, um, you see red triangles that represent the chronic average conditions in bottom waters for soluble reactive phosphorus. And for most reef sites in this study area, phosphorus levels do not exceed the published threshold values um, above which harm to corals would be expected. And the exceptions to this are the ones that are circled uh, in, in black, the, the red dots and triangles. And so those are obviously at St. Lucie Inlet at the northernmost extension of the ecosystem conservation area and government cut at the southernmost extension of the ECA. And then the graph on the right, or excuse me, the map on the right indicates dissolved inorganic nit nitrogen. Um, and basically you can see that any amount higher than the smallest shown, which is the, the light pink uh, triangles, may be harmful to corals. So essentially, almost all of the corals throughout the ecosystem conservation area might be negatively impacted by nitrogen, um, which is an indication of, of wastewater, um, either septic or, or outfalls. And you can see the darkest of the red triangles and red dots, again, are at the northernmost um, extension of the ECA at the St. Lucie Inlet and the southernmost extension at Government Cut. Our third take home point, which is that comparison to our benthic monitoring program can shed some light on the reef health. Um, our analysis showed that an increase in certain analytes, such as nutrients, correlate with a decrease in hard coral. And that same increase in certain analytes, such as nutrients, correlates with an increase in algae. So keep in mind that algae grows quicker than corals, and so when algae settles on a reef and grows, it can take up the space that corals might otherwise be able to grow in. Slide six discusses why all of this matters and what we can do with the information that we have. We actually have contractors that are um, currently comparing our water quality data set with stony coral tissue loss disease data to look for correlations that may indicate where uh, water quality is more detrimental to reef health because of a disease. Um, we are also in the process of developing an, an ECA or coral specific uh, water quality regulatory thresholds. Um, so determining, doing the science background to eventually determine how much of each analyte, such as nitrogen or phosphorus, um, could be allowed while still maintaining coral health. 
Uh, and finally, we can use this data to detect changes after management actions are implemented. So things like how does water quality change after the ocean outfalls are shut down in 2025, or um, how uh, does the water quality change and the, the reef health um, hopefully increase after some septic to sewer conversions um, are completed. This is a powerful data set that I, I went through very you know, briefly this this afternoon, um, but it could be used to establish some baseline um, appropriate water quality standards that can protect corals, um, as well as baseline for watershed management and land-based sources of pollution reduction projects. There are um, some possible explanations for some of the differences that we're seeing um, in the different site types and the, between the different inlets. And um, some of my, my partners, um, Josh and John, are gonna begin to connect those dots with their presentations. Um, Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Joshua Voss. I'm the executive director of the Cooperative Institute for Ocean Exploration Research and Technology, as well as an associate research professor at Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute at Florida Atlantic University. Um, thank you all very much for taking the time to uh, listen and learn a bit about uh, the coral reef research that we've been undertaking uh, in Martin County um, for over a decade now. Um, I'm going to be speaking today about a project that is currently focused on advancing coral research and resilience uh, on southeast Florida coral reefs in general, um, but I'll be focusing my comments today on the work we've been doing in Martin County, specifically at St. Lucie Reef. St. Lucie Reef is a really interesting location, uh, both biologically and geologically. It lies just south of St. Lucie Inlet, and this is a particularly interesting location where both tropical and temperate species commingle and create amazing biodiversity. So the area bounded by the state park shown here with black lines uh, includes a diverse number of benthic habitats, including coral reefs. And these have had historically extremely high biodiversity relative to other locations in the region. For example, more than 250 species of fish have been recorded here. And this is really the northern terminus along the Florida coastline for several hard coral species. And 24 coral, uh, coral species are located here, um, including previously the endangered mountainous star coral was found in this region as well, or Orbicella faviolata. I've shown an outline of where we've been conducting act research activities for the past several years. Um, and you'll notice that four of those sites are located at St. Lucie Reef in Martin County. Um, this is an area that unfortunately has had really significant impacts from both coral disease and Hurricane Irma uh, in the past three to four years. Of Hurricane Irma, subsequent discharges from the estuary system thereafter, as well as uh, stony coral tissue loss disease, have resulted in a combined roughly 80% loss of adult corals in the St. Lucie Reef region. The declines that we've observed have been coincident with freshwater releases and, and major rainfall events, including hurricanes within the St. Lucie Estuary Basin. Um, and so understanding how these events impact corals is critical to maintaining this resource. St. Lucie Reef is shown in blue. And just after Hurricane Irma in November 2017 is when we saw the highest incidence of stony coral tissue loss disease um, on the reef. Uh, nearly 25% of the corals that were present um, demonstrated signs consistent with SCTLD. I wanted to just give a summary as well as some recommendations moving forward. Um, first, really we've seen a combination of devastating coral disease, hurricane, and freshwater discharge impacts at St. Lucie Reef. If you look at the time series over to the right, from June 2017, um, we saw you know, large, vibrant, healthy colonies like this greater star coral, um, upwards of a meter in size. By October of 2017, disease was quite apparent. And by March of 2018, this colony had died completely. Faced with the amount of destruction we were seeing and the amount of loss we were seeing on this on this reef um, as well as on other reefs throughout Florida we really wanted to try to to 
come up with a way where we could help to preserve and protect some of the reefs that are being exposed to the disease incidents throughout Florida and elsewhere throughout the Caribbean. And through uh, collaborative partnerships and some research that's gone on in my lab, we've been able to demonstrate that antibiotic treatments with amoxicillin are more than 95% effective in treating disease-affected corals, and that this is a, an intervention technique that is, is not only highly effective, but can be used uh, to continue to protect corals in our region, including St. Lucie Reef. I think to quantify the impacts of freshwater discharge impacts on St. Lucie Reef and the corals that are there, we need a coordinated combination of both experiments, um, monitoring in the field, and modeling efforts uh, to understand the system as a whole. Finally, uh, our next steps will be doing a 3D mapping of all corals at St. Lucie Reef. We'll be undertaking a new uh, restoration test project uh, including sites at St. Lucie Reef. We're looking at trying to understand why certain corals are resistant or resilient to disease. And then we have a number of new uh, directions targeted at antibiotic resistance, understanding coral salinity thresholds, and understanding uh, what role nutrients may play in exacerbating this, the disease. Thank you all very much for your time. I appreciate the opportunity to speak, and I welcome any feedback or questions you may have. You can contact me here below. Thank you for all your efforts to help safeguard Martin County and its natural resources. Hello, commissioners. My name's John Ramsey. I'm a principal coastal engineer for Applied Coastal Research and Engineering. For approximately the last 20 years, I've been assisting the county with issues related to the inlet, and the estuary, ranging from sediment transport related processes through water quality concerns. I'm going to be building on what Jamie and Josh had talked about. Specifically, I'm going to be focused on freshwater impacts as, it, as they are measured offshore of St. Lucie Inlet and across the reef, reef system, primarily south of the inlet. Um, as you see on this map, we have the hard bottom shown with the green shading. There's a full range of 12 stations. Those are the numbers shown in white, uh, where uh, NOAA and DEP have actually measured monthly samples since approximately 2016. I'm also gonna be talking a little bit later about some uh, continuous measurements that were done more recently by the county. Uh, one of the things that uh, I wanna focus on is some of the high flow events, and the high freshwater inflow events, both from the uh, watershed as well as from Lake Okeechobee, that occurred over the time period of 2017 and 2018. From the monthly measurement data, we have salinity measurements both at the top and the bottom, and it should be understood that at the top, we expect the salinity levels to be lower because fresh water tends to be lighter and, and stay on top. Now, one of the things we see from an example measurement station, and that's uh, pointed with the arrow, uh, you can see where the station is on the right figure, um, the left figure shows uh, a full range of uh, both the measurements as well as the freshwater inflow. On the top are the salinity measurements. And one of the things we see is this sawtooth uh, plot with a red shaded area below and white above. That red shaded area indicates impacts uh, to the coral. So if the salinity drops into that level, into that shaded area, we definitely have impacts to the coral, uh, which could be either just harm, but it also could be destruction of the coral resources offshore. And so what we can see is that for many time periods, and again, this ranges from 2016 to present, for many time periods, we see that the salinity level drops to a point where we are having impacts to the corals offshore. And if you look at the bottom plot, the bottom subplot, we see that the freshwater inflow, as the freshwater inflow increases to the estuary, that's when we have the dominant impacts of uh, salinity offshore and the harm that is created. Uh, we see these both in the 2017 and 2018 time period when we had high freshwater inflow events. As well as the longer term measurements of monthly data, we also have data more recently collected in the end of 2020 where we actually have continuous measurements. And again, the shaded area shows the time period when we have harm the red plot 
shows the salinity level. And you can see when the, when the freshwater inflow shown in, with the black line is relatively low, we have uh, high salinities offshore. As the freshwater increases, we can see a direct correlation between the drop in salinity offshore. And in this case, the salinity level drops to an extremely low level of below 10 parts per thousand, which is very brackish and very harmful to the uh, coral resource, resources offshore. And it should be noted that this station is actually located two miles south of the inlet. So with some of the modeling tools we've developed over the years, uh, specifically for the sediment transport analysis, we can actually span these tools into looking at the data sets related to salinity and how salinity is altered uh, through freshwater inflow. And we can actually look at this for a full range of conditions that are experienced by the estuary. This model simulation illustrates uh, freshwater inflow as it's increasing over an approximately two week period where the dark blues show the offshore conditions of salinity that are very high. And we see the, the lower salinity water migrating towards the entrance over that time period when we see an increase in freshwater inflow. So in summary, the data clearly indicates that there's a direct link between freshwater discharge and the reduction in offshore salinity that is damaging to the coral resources. Uh, there's also no doubt that releases from Lake Okeechobee exacerbate and prolong damaging conditions within the estuary and offshore waters. This is shown again with a uh, series of data that's available. Our ongoing efforts are aimed at developing predictive tools that quantify impacts of freshwater releases on corals for a full range of conditions. I want to thank Jamie, Josh, and John for their commitment to better understanding underlying conditions and the drivers that impact our ecosystem with an eye towards a more effective management. As these professionals come together, we've begun to see a more complete picture of how our water environment is functioning. A wide array of data is being collected in Martin County's coastal environment on a long-term basis by multiple parties. This map shows you how it all comes together. We've developed a very comprehensive monitoring network of offshore conditions that has been developed in partnership with all of these other agencies. It was interesting that in October of 2020, when we were in the middle of low sum discussions that focused on impacts of large freshwater discharges onto nearby coral reefs, we also found out that the Corps was planning to start up forced discharges from Lake Okeechobee once again. It seemed obvious that if we could get instruments out on the reef in time, the data we could collect showing the impacts of these releases would be very important. Luckily, our local partners agreed, and within days we had obtained loaned instrumentation and installed the conductivity meters, which measure salinity, out on our reefs. I need to stop here for just a moment to recognize ORCA and Harbor Branch Oceanographic because without their immediate response, we never could have achieved this goal. And in this map, you can see the conductivity meter as it's overlaid with all the other data collection efforts. The record we are collecting will allow us to document the impacts of these forced discharges on our local marine environment. And also going back to Jamie's presentation, we know that when salinity drops because of the influx of fresh water, there are other constituents coming along with it. We hope that with the data collection funded here and by an upcoming effort funded by EPA, we will be able to document exactly what that looks like. I hope this presentation has shown that all the monitoring and data analysis that has been going on for separate projects whether they're estuarine water quality, Lake Okeechobee management, inlet and beach management, and coral conservation are coming together, linked by the water that connects them and the ecosystem it supports. We are now able to bring that modeling and analysis to support water quality improvement efforts and expand upon our previous work. The supporting work done by other agencies increases the value of our data and improves our ability to develop a true ecosystem management viewpoint. NOAA recognized the importance of designated habitat for their threatened and endangered coral species. We have submitted a letter in support of this designation, which, if established, would add an additional consideration 
as we develop a new lake management st strategy and will increase the importance of improving the water quality coming out through St. Lucie Inlet. Given the rapid decline of our ecosystems, the collaborative effort from all the agencies and multiple disciplines discussed in this presentation and listed on this slide is essential for us to get the comprehensive system-wide understanding so that we can focus our efforts where they will make the most gains and buy us time while we seek to resolve compounding issues. I want to thank you for your attention and open this up for questions.